So today we are going to jump into tutorial 1.3 of our control system series, and we are going to learn about transfer functions. So in this tutorial, Kushal starts to get into the more practical matters, because in tutorial 1.2, the last tutorial that you probably just came from, you may have noticed that the, the form that we got our mathematical expression was basically useless. There wasn't really anything we could do with it. So by taking that differential equation and switching it to the S domain using a Laplace function, or Laplaceifying it, if I may make up a verb myself, um, we get a form that we can actually use. We can create a transfer function. And so before we get into what exactly this means, I just want to reiterate what we mentioned the last time, and that is that all of this applies to an LTI, or a linear time invariant system, which basically just means it's a system that doesn't care anything about time, like if I'm doing um, applying an input now, or in five days, five years, or whatever, and it has a couple of particular properties about it, like if you multiply the input by a certain integer, you're going to have the same multiplication factor on the output, and then if you add things on the input, it'll be added linearly on the output. So just wanted to bring that up again because it's important to note that a lot of the things we're talking about here only apply to LTI systems. Okay, so with that, a transfer function is quite straightforward. All it is is it is the LTI output over the LTI input, and that's really it. Now, obviously, conceptually, that's quite straightforward, but it gets a little bit more complicated in the math and other things like that, but we'll get into that right now. So part of the challenge of having a transfer function is that you may say, hey, I've got an input over an output, but, or excuse me, an output over an input, that's important, but how do you model, model that mathematically? Because you can have different inputs, and you can basically, in the real world, have an infinite amount of inputs, but that gets complicated. You know, infinity messes with math all over the place. So typically what we do is when we are trying to show exactly how a, a system operates using a transfer function, we assume one of three inputs. Now there's more inputs, but these three are the most common. And the first one is an impulse input. So if you look at it mathematically, it's one that as you're going across the time, it will go and it'll just shoot up and down and then continue out. And this is most akin to, let's say you have a pendulum and you just flick it. So you just have a very quick um, input. And honestly, mathematically, if you've ever seen this and it's a Dirac, like a weird sign, I'm not exactly sure how to do that with your handwriting. It's assumed to be infinitely skinny over time and infinitely, infinitely tall in, um, in magnitude. So in, it's just an assumption that you have a very quick flick. And so this is one of those inputs that when you're trying to see exactly how a system works, you can put this input into your transfer function and then see what the output is. Now that's the first input that you commonly see. The second one is a step input. And so with that one, it's uh, a little bit easier to say mathematically because it's just typically use of t. And that is where your input is at zero and it jumps up to one and keeps on going like that. And so in the case of that pendulum, instead of flicking it, it's like you take it and you just use your hand to move it from zero to one, and you just hold it there. And obviously that's going to react quite a bit differently than if you flick it. So that unit step and the impulse are the, probably the two most common of the three that I'm going to mention here, and you'll see them all over the place. And one of the fun things is particularly with the step um, function, which uh, unchanged, this is typically assume that u of t starts at time t equals zero, and then you can do different things to shift it left to the right, you can change the magnitude, all those sorts of things, but when you're doing some of these more generic tests, you just assume it's a zero to one at time equals zero, and then it's pretty straightforward. Now the third thing that you will typically see on your inputs of your transfer functions is the, the linear input, where you have a um, an input that is increasing linearly like that up to technically infinity. Now, if you have something like that, you're going to have some serious stability issues and there's going to be some weirdness, which is why you don't see that as often. But um, you do on occasion see it. And going back to the pendulum, it's sort of like taking it and then slowly over time just pushing it more and more and more. And obviously that's where the whole pendulum example falls away because at what point it just doesn't make any more sense. But those are the three different inputs you generally see when people are trying to see how a transfer function and how a system represented by a transfer function 
will react. Okay, so Kushal in his written tutorial has gone through and he's taken an RLC circuit and broken it down, showing you how you get the original uh, equation, how you use Laplace to turn it into a transfer function, and how you can actually uh, start applying these things. And I highly recommend you go and check that out. Again, I, I want to touch on the more conceptual things, but once you get into the math, it, he does a great job going over that stuff in the written tutorial. So go check that out. So with that being said, I want to talk about a couple of things that you can learn from the transfer function. If it hasn't already been made clear, the role of a transfer function is just a simple representation of how a system will react when you give it a given input. And the reason this is so important is because, again, we're building the foundation that you need to understand before we go on to the further tutorials in which we are modeling real-life systems and also trying to mathematically decide whether or not a system is stable or not. So that is one of the main reasons why we have the transfer function. The second thing is that these transfer functions, they are completely independent of the system, of nature, of, of their input. So if you want to give it a, an impulse um, input or a step input, that doesn't change the transfer function itself. It just changes the output of it. So that's kind of an important distinction to make here is that Yes, you will change the way it reacts, but you're not changing the system inherently. And then finally, the third thing is that with these transfer functions, you can have a transfer function that represents multiple systems that are completely unrelated to each other. It, the same transfer function could uh, represent a, um, an electrical system, a mechanical system, multiple different types of electrical systems. And so you can't really take a transfer system or excuse me, a transfer function, and say, oh, looking at this transfer function, it must be representing a, a, an RLC um, circuit with resistance equal to this or capacitance equal to that. It doesn't really work that way. You basically, you can only go from the system to the transfer function, and then you lose a lot of that detail there, which, again, as long as you have the association, it's not a big deal. But just be aware of that, that you could look at a transfer function and say, oh yeah, I've seen that one before. It doesn't really mean anything. So I'm actually going to write down really quick the equation that Kushal comes up with with an RLC circuit. And I want to talk about this equation very briefly before we wrap this up. So uh, let me just take a moment to put this down. Okay, and I just wanted to put this out there so you can see as an example, like this is what a transfer function looks like. And you have the S squared, which comes when you create the Laplace, you get the, these S's and you notice how it's S squared. S and then one where it doesn't have an S. And so that's very, very common. You'll see S to the fourth, S to the third, S squared, S, um, S to the one, which is just S, and then is basically S to zero, which is one. And all of this stuff actually means something. So even just looking at this, you can get some ideas on whether or not this is going to be a stable system. Is it something that when you flick the pendulum, is it going to come back and center again? Or did you flick something else and it's going to go careening off into the wild and be absolutely insane? So you will, over the next couple of courses, understand how this mathematically represents something and how you get poles and zeros because you can also have things up on the top. And so you'll have things where um, certain inputs will make it so you have you have a zero output where this whole equation will equal zero, or you'll have poles where if you have a zero on the bottom, it makes it infinite, infinite, and it just gets, gets really complicated. And that's actually pretty cool. It's pretty cool that you can take this model, you, you can take a system, create a mathematical equivalent, turn it into a transfer function, run it through some calculations, and then mathematically say, oh yeah, if I put this input in, it's either gonna go berserk, it's gonna oscillate, it's gonna settle back down to something else. It's incredibly powerful and I love it. So with that, uh, and just getting a brief view of what the equations are gonna be looking like over the next couple of tutorials, I think we're ready to wrap this up. The only thing I wanna say is that you can use Scilab and Xcos we think it's Xcos, not Xcos. We had this discussion earlier. So you can use those to put in inputs like this and actually see what comes out, comes out on the outside. You can get the poles and zeros, you can, uh, which then you can also compare that to um, the outputs of your, your graphs and see how, oh, hey, you know, if I have a pole in the right hand of my, my graph, that means that this is unstable and it's all crazy. And those are really, really exciting things that we're gonna get into later and I don't wanna get out of myself. So this is transfer functions and this is 
where we take that differential equation, make it a lot more simple into just some basic algebra using Laplace, and then we can use our different inputs to see what our outputs are. And between using our inputs and between uh, using this equation, we can learn a lot of information about our control systems. As always, I highly, highly, highly recommend you go check out Kushal's written tutorials. He does an amazing job, and he's way ahead of me, so you can go a lot farther than me, uh, than where we are with the videos. And you will be very, very impressed, as I have been, with the quality of those tutorials. Uh, if you did enjoy this video and you're enjoying this series and, or any of our other series, please like and subscribe and all that good stuff. As it is, we will catch you in the next one. Have a great one.